Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this AirCut webinar, specially organized as part of AU Green Week as a partner event. My name is Clémence Contant. I'm the communication manager for the AirCut project representing Revolve, a communication group based in Brussels, specializing in the dissemination of AU funded projects. I'm honored to be moderating this event on the AirCut technology, which is helping to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the shipping industry. The ERCOT project is part of the Horizon 2020 program and aims to develop an air containing foil, reducing ship's drag in the water and dust, the oil consumption and gas emissions. This webinar will run for one hour and will be available to watch again on our YouTube channel. If you have any questions, please, use the Q&A option available in the toolbar at the bottom of the screen. Many experts today from the projects are here to present the challenges and various other aspects of the ERCOT project, starting with Jonathan from Frauna First Year. Jonathan, the floor is yours. Thank you all. Thank you, Clemence. Yes, and hi, welcome uh, everybody from my side. My name is Jonathan Weisheit, and I'm a research associate at Fraunhofer CML located in Hamburg. Uh, I'm here to introduce the uh, ACO project, so the project itself, the idea behind it, uh, why we are doing the whole thing, and also I will give you uh, an introduction to what you can expect today of this webinar. Okay, the first problem is that uh, shipping uh, emits a lot of emissions. So it is responsible for the transportation of almost 80% of all global goods, but it uh, consumes a lot of fuel. And naturally this comes uh, hand in hand with the emission of a lot of CO2 and other greenhouse gases. So only shipping is responsible for about 2.5% of global emissions every year. There are some rules that uh, try to prohibit the whole thing. Next slide, please. So there are a few regulations that are already enforced and there are other goals like uh, cutting the CO2 budget by 50% until 2050. But these are just the goals and regulations. And we thought about it, how can it be done? How can we achieve this? So we got this project called Air Coach. Next slide, please. So ACOD, this means 10 partners from six countries all over Europe. Originally, the program or the project was uh, planned to last for three years, 63 months. But additional to some problems we had within the project, there was the um, corona pandemic. So there was a lot of trouble for us to get our project done. And we are uh, very happy to get the extension for 12 more months. So in about one year, hopefully we got all tasks that we had on our bucket list. And that code received a funding of about 5.3 million euros. So what is the idea behind ACODE and how can nature now help to reduce greenhouse gases? Let's take a look at the next slide. What you see here is the Zalvinia plant. And what is so special about Zalvinia? When we zoom in on the Zalvinia plant step by step, you see this very unique surface of one uh, of the surface of one plant. Zalvinia is capable of retaining a permanent air layer when put underwater. And we put this effect on a self adhesive foil. And let's take a look at the next slide. There you can see how we can get from the Zalvinia surface to a ship house surface that has a permanent air layer. So the Zalvinia plant, it has hydrophobic and hydrophilic properties. This was uh, copied and put on a foil. This foil again was put on a safe adhesive uh, surface and the aim is to produce a large scale of aircraft foil, which can cover the whole um, hull of a ship. And then the ship will have reduced friction. Let's take a look at the next slide to see how it can work. So when looking at a velocity profile, really close to the wall, the velocity of the flowing water is zero. 
this is clear because the wall doesn't move. So when going with an increasing distance from the wall, the velocity gets higher and we have a high gradient, which means we have high shear stresses. When we now don't have a conventional wall, but a wall that is covered with air coat, we have an air layer. And above the air layer, the velocity is greater than zero. So we have a low gradient, we have lower shear stresses, and this means we have reduced skin friction. Next slide, please. The overall benefits of air coat is this passive air lubrication. So we have lower friction, which means lower energy use, lower cost, but also we have a physical barrier. When there is an air layer around the hull, biofouling is reduced, corrosion is not possible, we don't need any biocides, and noise is reduced. All this combined means lower emissions. And um, the benefit of air code is that it is in refit technology. So we can put it on every existing ship and there is no application limit to it. Next slide, please. Okay, you might be familiar with um, paints that is put on ships. And also there is uh, this well-known technology by Silverstream, which have bubbles around the hull to reduce friction. This would be active air lubrication. What with air code, we're aiming on a passive air lubrication. So we put on the foil, we put the ship back in the water, and we have a permanent um, air layer around the hull that does not need any more energy to stay stable. Now I'm a little curious. I would, last, I would like to ask everybody on the, in the audience who has ever any experience with self-adhesing foil, self-adhesing, I'm so sorry, self-adhesing foil on a ship hull. So to participate, it's very easy. Just grab your smartphone, scan the QR code and answer the question, yes or no. Okay, let's wait a couple of seconds to, um, for some more answers to come in. It seems people are a little bit shy. Okay, so it looks like of all the people who have participated, they have never worked with adhesive coating. Thank you for everybody who participated. Let's take a look at uh, our experience and the project. Oh, there is a little malfunctioning of the presentation. Okay, so. We had our experiences with the self adhesive file and we used it throughout the project in different situations. So, of course, there is the production of the um, of the air code foil. You can see the structure that has been mimicked by the Zavinia plant. We did some numerical simulations, some physical experiments, and all our project results show that there are complex dependencies on air layer stability application depth, fouling behavior, drag reduction, production feasibility, and of course, the choice of the correct and best suitable material. And also there is the problem that the larger the depths, the higher the cost for production and innovations are. Okay, I hope this gives you a little overview on the project itself, what the uh, Zavinia effect is, and you will learn about it in just a few minutes a little more. So let's take a look at the next slide. There is uh, one problem that uh, will be discussed here today. So there are different tasks, different demands to the air code foil, and every air code foil is a little bit different. So we reproduce different types. So there is the problem of air code scaling, and this will be the main topic now today that will be discussed in every of our presentations. Let's take a look at the sessions that we have prepared for you today. Okay, the first session will be presented by Yuka Pekka, who is a research, 
so sorry, senior researcher at the Finnish Meteorological Institute. He and his team, he took a look at the large scale. So what does friction reduction for a global fleet mean? And what is the brain problem with it? In the second session, you will learn more about the Zavinia effect, the accord structure, the different sizes of the pillars. This will be presented by Stefan Walheim. He is a researcher at the Karlsruhe Institut für Technologie. He and his team, he developed the, they developed the accord structure and they're producing a lot of this material. And the third session presented by Christoph Wilms and Albert Bass, um, coming from Hochschule Bremen, they will, simula they will show you how they simulate air code in numerical simulations and how the drag reduction in small scale is working. So this is it from me for now. I will hand over the mic to Yuka Pecker and he will tell you all about uh, global impact of air code. Hey, thank you, Jonathan. My name is Jukka Pekka Jalkanen. I'm uh, from the Finnish Meteorological Institute. So my talk will be um, a description of a modeling exercise that we did in, in this project. So if you go to the next slide, please. Okay, so this is the same map that was already shown in the previous slide. So basically, uh, the shipping is a small fraction of the CO2 emitted from, uh, from human activities. So basically, what we are discussing today is uh, kind of outlined in the box in, uh, on the left. So these are the kind of things that can be applied to the existing fleet. So if you introduce this drag reducing foil into the existing fleet, then you can hopefully reduce the fuel consumption and also the emissions from ships. So this is not about uh, new fuels or new designs or engines or abatement. These are kind of longer term things. But the uh, benefit of air code would be that, okay, that would be applicable immediately once it is done, uh, once it is ready. So if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is probably uh, a figure that is familiar to many of you. So this describes the energy flows uh, on a ship. So basically, uh, the intention of the slide is to show that, okay, there is a fraction of the fuel that goes to the moving the ship. So basically the propulsion part. So that's the green, green arrows here. So in addition, you need fuel also to generate heat and electricity. So these are the uh, uh, yellow and orange arrows. So basically uh, if, if we are looking at drag, drag reduction and the friction part of uh, uh, the part of the fuel that you use to overcome the friction, then that is uh, uh, roughly around 70 or 75%. Uh, of the uh, global fleet consumption. So basically uh, uh, this complicated thing uh, changes this image if, if you have, for example, a different kind of vessel. So if you have this kind of a, a shaft generators or if your uh, uh, power transmission is not mechanical anymore, so you're using an electrical uh, electricity to, uh, to drive the propeller and these kind of things. So uh, it gets very tricky quite fast. But if you go to the next slide, please. Okay, so here is a kind of a simple pie chart. So if we are using about 70% of the fuel for propulsion, then roughly half of that propulsion fuel is about the friction. Of course, it, it is speed dependent. It depends on the ship type and the, uh, things like these. But this is a kind of an example of the magnitude of the effect. So if you are... Uh, looking at the um, uh, roughness of the surface. So if you have a very rough surface, then you have more friction and you have to use more fuel to uh, propel the vessel at a certain speed. So what we were looking at uh, on the modeling side is that, okay, we're looking at different components of, of the resistance. So basically where the fuel goes, if you think about propulsion. And the um, uh, graph on the lower right is kind of a pointing these different contributions out. So there is a contribution from uh, overcome the friction. There is one that uh, includes the uh, residual resistance part. And then there is this roughness contribution. And the orange um, uh, parabolic shape here is kind of an indication. If you look at the scale on the right, you realize, that, okay, at some 12 knot speed, the half of your uh, resistance is from friction. So this is the part that the air code is now trying to tackle. So we're trying to understand it, what would be the kind of a significance of drag reduction if applied in the global fleet. So if you go to the next slide, please. Now, 
having a look at the global fleet first. So basically, what kind of ships are there? What is the kind of a, a histogram of different drafts? So how large are the vessels? So where the most of the wet surface is and things like these. So we know, I like to understand that, okay, if we apply this um, uh, foil into a certain type of ships or certain um, a part of the wet surface, then what kind of impact we would expect on, on the fuel savings part? And of course, there are complications like, uh, whether the ship is in the ballast or whether it's loaded. But uh, we would like to understand using the modeling tools that, okay, how much of this uh, fuel that could be saved with the air cold. So if you go to the next slide, please. Now, this is a parametric study. So basically, uh, uh, there are methods to reduce friction. And it was already mentioned that, okay, you can use air bubbles or you can modify the surface coatings and do things like these. And this uh, graph here, or the uh, surface graph here, is a kind of a thought experiment. So what happens if you eliminate the friction part completely with, in, in a varying degree in, in the global fleet? So what would be the kind of maximum effect that you, get, you can get out of this if you completely uh, eliminate the friction part? And that is about 35, 37% of the, of the fleet fuel. So that would be the kind of perfect case where you, don't, you have no friction at all. But then the big uh, question becomes, okay, if you uh, don't have the friction part, do you maintain your speed and you benefit from the uh, lower fuel consumption? Or is there a temptation of going faster? Saying that, okay, with the same amount of fuel, I can reduce my travel time by X days in this. So uh, it still has the kind of these two options. But if you're uh, interested in reducing the fuel consumption, then you would travel with the same speed and you would make the benefit of uh, reduced fuel consumption. Go to the next slide, please. Okay, uh, this is a busy table. I took this from the fourth IMO greenhouse gas report. So basically the purpose of this is to draw the attention on the group seven that is marked red here, this air lubrication part. So in the fourth IMO greenhouse gas report, there's a scenario saying that, okay, if you apply air lubrication uh, to a whole global fleet, then what is the expected impact on the savings of our CO2 abatement potential? And there it is stated that, okay, 2.26% less CO2 if you apply uh, air lubrication to the, all of the fleet. So that's a fairly conservative estimate in that sense. But of course, it depends, uh, it depends on the performance of the foil. So how large is the drag reduction um, if, if you do it in, in uh, modifying the surface structure? So if you will, com uh, as again, remember that, okay, complete elimination of the friction means 35% uh, savings in the fuel. So 2.26% is, it doesn't sound very much, but let's see if we can improve on that. If you go to the next slide, please. Uh, okay, there was already a mentioning about these other potential benefits. So one, one of them is that, okay, if you don't have a direct contact of the seawater with the steel hull, so you have an air layer in between. It means that, okay, uh, these biofouling uh, or bioorganisms, they have hard time attaching themselves to the hull. And that means that, okay, if there is this physical barrier, then it means that you don't have to necessarily use these toxic uh, anti-fouling paints anymore. So every square meter that you can uh, avoid using these paints means that, okay, there are less organometallic compounds in the seawater. So as an example, I drew up this uh, number from the Baltic Sea. So this was an estimate that we did in 2019 about uh, anti-fouling paints in the Baltic Sea area. So for example, copper is very commonly used as a biocide in paints. And we estimated, okay, in the Baltic Sea in 2019, ap approximately 370 tons of copper was released through anti-fouling paints to the seawater. And then the question becomes, okay, uh, what is the role of this um, uh, certain metals in, in the seawater? So what does it mean, for example, for marine life? And that's a tricky thing to answer. But at least uh, in, in the air code project, there are these fouling tests that are being conducted in, the, in, in Malta. So basically trying to see that, okay, if, if the air layer is there, then what is the, uh, what is the ability of certain organisms of um, uh, how do they attach? How do they react to this, uh, this kind of a situation? And another uh, potential benefit is the noise reduction part. Of course, on the right, uh, right-hand side, on the lower right-hand side, you will see that, okay, this is a, 
a kind of a noise map of a vessel traveling at different speeds. And you notice that there is this large bump at certain points. So basically this is the kind of an indication that you have your propeller and that's the main source of a noise on a ship. So basically that's when the ships start to get noisier. So that's a phenomena known as cavitation starts. So uh, if you apply the foil to the hull, you are not operating on the propeller itself. You are only dampening the noise that comes from the machinery. So you have a steel hull, you have inside a large engine vibrating, and these vibrations, then, uh, then the noise that gets transmitted to the water, if there is an air layer in between, it's a kind of a physical barrier uh, for this noise transmission. So it seems that, okay, there is a dampening of noise and depends on the thickness of the air layer. But the main source of noise, the propeller itself, is not affected by this. So if you go to this. Okay, so this is my uh, concluding slide. So basically, uh, the idea is that, okay, if we manage to get the, the drag reduction at the very, uh, very nice level, then it doesn't mean that it is automatically cutting like 50% of the global feed fuel. No, it is only operating on half of the propulsion fuel. fuel. So in that sense, the order of magnitude, the maximum effect that you can get is under 40%. It, it's between 35, 37%, according to our studies. Now, it can mean that if you have these kind of savings and you, ha you have to use less fuel to propel the vessel, then you can choose. So do you opt for the uh, a smaller fuel consumption or would you increase your speed? So this is a kind of a thing to do. So if you want to reduce your emissions, do you maintain the same speed or do you want to go faster to save time? And of course, these are uh, kind of choices which are impacted by if there's ever going to be emission trading systems or any kind of market-based measures or price on carbon. So it, ha it has a direct link to that discussion there. But the other potential benefits of air cost, so uh, the reduced fuel consumption would be one thing, but the another things would be that, okay, there would be less toxic uh, organometallic compounds in the water, and also the uh, vessel noise from machinery sources would be dampened. And uh, it was a kind of a curious thing to me to learn that, okay, uh, nature has already solved some of these problems. So creating this kind of a passive air layer then that was an interesting observation from my side, uh, personal side, because I didn't know about this. So uh, this was a very, very nice example of things that, okay, you don't have to reinvent the wheel since nature has done part of the work for you. And with this, I would give floor to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Yuka Pekka. Um, just one question we received on chat. Um, how is the effect of biofueling included in the modeling? Could you answer to that? Yeah, so basically um, modeling the biofueling part, it's not very simple. So it is a function of, for example, uh, seawater salinity or seawater temperature. It can be affected by sunlight or different kinds of organisms. So it's not a very easy thing to do. So one thing we can do is, that, okay, we alter this uh, roughness part of this resistance. That's one way of doing that. So we are not uh, heavily concentrating on the description of the biofouling in the project. So we are trying to understand that, okay, what is the... Uh, kind of impact on, on the friction part. So uh, adding the modeling capability of biofouling uh, in, in this mix would require a project of its own. Of course, it can be thought at some point. So maybe, maybe there will be a project with this kind of uh, task, but it is not the kind of a main focus in, um, in the modeling work that is done in the air code. Of course, there are some testing to be done, for example, from the experimental side, but on the global fleet modeling side, we don't have the full uh, full biofouling description in the modeling as such. Very well, thank you, Yuka Pekka. Um, so let's go to the session two. Stefan, the floor is Yes, hello there, Stefan. Um, maybe, yes. <laughs> So I'm from the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, which is a merger of a university and a, a, a national institute for research in, in Germany. 
And so we are we are most uh, involved in the production and the design of the microstructures. And I will tell you a little bit about uh, the Salvini effect itself because we also made uh, some major contribution in understanding uh, the Salvinia effect in the plant. So please go to the next slide. Uh, so uh, you have seen already this picture. This shows uh, the plant, the, the, which is the biological uh, uh, part of our project, of our idea. And you see this plant is usually floating on water, but if you put it underwater, it can uh, keep the air and you it does this with these hydrophobic uh, hairs on, on its surface. And we try to mimic this, this structure. If you go to the next slide, you see that uh, this, uh, this plant has these this little uh, hairs and at the top of the hairs, there are some hydrophilic red dots, uh, which uh, uh, are responsible for keeping the contact to the, to the water. If this is not happening, then the, the air can make big bubbles and go off the leaf. So it's important that you have a certain pinning force of the water to the, to the plant. And in our uh, air coat foil, we also have this pinning. We have no uh, direct uh, strong pinning, but we have a pinning. And this pinning is important to make, uh, to make the system work, to keep the air in shape. So if you go to the next slide, I can uh, show you a recent publication of our group uh, about this effect. And what you see is the, is the plant itself. On the left side, you see uh, the, a droplet of water showing this uh, repellency. And, but if you put the plant underwater, it, it is a closed system. So the, the air is trapped in within these this hairs. And if you now uh, connect the interior of this this of, of this air with a tube to the outside, then the, the air can escape. That means that this closed system of air has a spring constant, has a, a certain hardness. And to, to show this, I will go to the next slide. Uh, here, this you can see this uh, the piece of the leaf inside the water, and you see it's 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 the comp uh, the, the air is inside uh, the leaf, and if we now open this leaf, go to the next slide, please. Um, then over next. Yes, if we open this, you see that the uh, air bubble is escaping. So the air is only stable in the system if it's, it's trapped and closed. And so this opening uh, simulates an infinite thickness of this air layer. So the, the, the thin air layer, as thinner it is, the more stable it gets. And if you go to the next slide, uh, we can calculate the thickness and measure the thickness and the pinning force of this of these hairs. And if we calculate this pinning force and compare it to the stability we we can we can measure, we see that only one percent of this of the stability is due to the pinning force, and ninety nine percent is responsible is the, the the spring of the air itself and the the the, the matter that it is closed the air, okay? So that means the air spring effect is very important to, to explain the stability of this air layer. If you go to the next slide, uh, we can see on the video, if you click on the video, how it, what happens if I open the air spring, I open it by opening this valve and then the air is just squeezed out. So in the, in the system where you have an overpressure, the air will just squeeze and the squeezing of the air is possible uh, if if we open the system, but if it's closed, it's a stable system. So this is the other way around. So overpressure is also uh, the air spring responsible for the stability. Okay, if you go to the next slide, uh, um, here I can show uh, the pictures, and you see the apparatus how we measure the volume which is squeezed out of the of the leaf, and and you can measure the it quantitatively. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, here again, I want to summarize that the air spring effect is an effective stabilizer of the air layer. So the air layer itself is only stable because it's a closed system and it can be, uh, it can, if you open it, it would be not as stable. Next slide, please. So now we go to the technical uh, realization of this uh, air spring and uh, Salvinia effect. And here on the bottom, you see a, a large a um, uh, piece of, of structure which we made and you see already the, the it's very similar. Of course, the size of these pillars is quite big here. It's about one millimeter in size. 
you go to the next slide. Um, if we want to go to smaller structure on the next slide, uh, you see what we are realizing. So we go to very, very small structures So the size here is in the, in the range of about 10 micrometer. And we go to smaller and smaller structure and I will explain why. We go to the next slide. So if you consider now this, the distance between two pillars, you can, uh, you can imagine if the pillars are too far away, then the pressure of the air, of the water underwater presses the, 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 uh, the water in between the pillars. And this can be prevented by putting them closer together. And if you calculate that, you can, you can calculate that at about 100 micrometer distance, we can only go down to 10 centimeter in the, in the water. If we go to 10 micrometer distance, we can already go to one meter. And if we go to one micrometer, we can already go to 10 meter. That means the structure size uh, or the distance between the pillars and some more effects, which I don't explain now, uh, are important that we have a good stability. The second big thing is the contact angle. That means the hydrophobicity of the material. Imagine you have a hydrophilic material and you make a structure, it's getting wet even better. But if you have a hydrophobic material and you make it structured and, and complex, then it gets uh, dry better. So that means uh, the contact angle, which is a measure for the hydrophobicity, is important. Then uh, the structure has to be producible. So of course, we have to make a, a process making them. And this process, of course, limits the fantasy of structure we can do. So we can only do structures which we can produce on a large area. And for the effective drag reduction, it's important that the contact between the pillars and the water should be small. So if we have only uh, very big pillars, then of course the drag reduction cannot be as good as if it would be very small. That you have seen in Jonathan's uh, presentation. So this the distance between the pillars, of course, and the space between the pillars do, do the friction reduction, not the pillars themselves. So we have to make small pillars on small distances. That's the message. Go to the next slide, please. So here you see that the, the family of structures we have made in the project. And we, go, we went down from a very large to very small structures on the lower side. Go to the next uh, slide, please. So here you see the, the, uh, some examples of structures we made and they are uh, imaged with the same scale. And here you see already what, what we have um, moved. So we went from the left to the right uh, within, the, within our um, optimization and structure evolution. So you see it's getting smaller and smaller. So go to the next slide, please. And the over next. And here you see now the product. So that is uh, the complete foil which we have produced. And you see already the, the, the size uh, of, the, of this material. If you go to the next slide, there are some numbers. So we have about 1,000 meter of this material made. And we, the, the size of this stripe is about 170 uh, millimeter, uh, millimeters or 17 centimeters. And this cor corresponds to about 170 square meters. And this corresponds again to about 7 billion, 7,000 billion microstructures we have made in this stripe. And that means we, we could really scale up the process of producing such small structures with a hydrophobic material. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, here you see the cover of the of the structure we make. So we have to cover it with a protection layer to make it uh, transportable, to make it also cuttable and uh, further processable because we have to put the adhesive layer on the backside and, and further process this. Go to the next slide, please. Yes, here you see the, the machine again and uh, the peer person working on it. So that's uh, our group in Karlsruhe in the labs. And you see the after optimization, uh, the thermoplastic film, the coating system was uh, implemented into this green layer. This could also be red on the right side. And here you see after rolling it up, we can transport it to the next process a step in with our partners in Belgium. Uh, next slide, please. 
So uh, you see this structure, what you see on the, on the top side, this is after 1000 meter of production. So still the structure quality remains the same. So our tool of making it is, is uh, able to make one kilometer of material. And uh, we put this cover layer on top to make it uh, protected against uh, the next process steps with rolling and, and winding and so on. Go to the next slide, please. So this is the conclusion. So the air spring effect uh, is effectively stabilizing the air layer. That's uh, an important uh, contribution to the understanding of the of the air, air spring and uh, Salvinia effect. And we could make a large area now of these microstructures, which get got smaller and smaller. And now we have already a thousand meters, and we can use them for all the tests which have to be made in, in the project. So that with that, I will end and hand over to Clemence. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. I have a question, uh, maybe to understand a bit better the difference between the aircraft technology and the Sabinia plant, the one you, you start from. Um, could you tell us how dense are the columns in the aircraft? Um, layer compared to the density of airs of the Salvinia yeah. plant? Yeah, so if you compare this directly, the space between two hairs in the Salvinia plant is about one millimeter. It can be a little bit less, could also be 500 micron, but it's around that. And the distance which we have here is about five to 10 micron. That means we have at least a factor of 10,000 more needles in the air coat uh, compared to the, to the Salvinia plant. And so this gives you a, a feeling for the structure minimization we made or the structure optimization. And it was not clear in the beginning of the process if this could be done at all with, with a scalable technology. So uh, earlier attempts to do that and still uh, other attempts from other groups are, they, they really produce in silicon. So in, in, in material which you use for, for semiconductor industry, yeah? so you, you use the technology making a computer chip and they produce a piece of silicon uh, and put it and, and, and drill it and, and machine it. And, and so this is something completely different. We have now a thermoplastic uh, material and we can, we can reduce the size so much. Yeah. Very well, thank you, Stefan. So now we will go to the third session and the last one with Albert Bartz and Christoph Wilms. Thank you very much, Clemence. Yeah, from the perspective of drag reduction, we prefer a thin layer of air on the surface of a ship hull. In this case, uh, water takes the air away and we have to refill air permanently. Therefore, a structure is necessary to retain the air, as mentioned before. Such a structure will reduce drag reduction in comparison to a thin air layer. But what is the influence of the size and the geometry that could be pillars, grooves, holes on drag reduction? Yeah, this was investigated using direct numerical simulation of a turbulent channel flow. But uh, why channel flow and not the flow around a ship hull? Because at the moment, no supercomputer worldwide is able to carry out such a simulation uh, at real sizes of ships. Yeah, before going into details, let's have a short look on a single result. Next slide, please. This is a view um, on an instantaneous velocity field on a structured surface with pillars. Blue color indicates zero velocity and towards red, the velocity increases. We can easily recognize the tips of the pillars in blue color around there's the air water interface modeled by a slip condition. Um, origin of the drag reduction is that slip which we have between that pillars and we can say that the drag is increased by all the parts of the structure which are in contact with water so we are interested to have as much uh, slip as possible. That means the higher the mean velocity is, 
on that surface, the higher is the drag reduction. Next slide, please. There's quite a lot of literature on this topic available and uh, different approaches are used to model the water-air interface. Um, the first publication, they use homogeneous um, surfaces with partial slip. Then there's an approach what we use, and there are also approaches with deformation of the interface. Christoph Wilms will now go deeper into detail. Next slide, please. Yes, thank you. So I will now continue now with the method. So as already mentioned, we use direct numerical simulation and here are some details. Um, we use, or here you see a channel on the right side uh, with pillars on top of both walls. And yeah, as already mentioned, we used um, a slip and no slip configuration um, to solve the Navier-Stokes equation which, which describes the flow. Um, we use two different codes, which is open form and NAC 5000. And we modified into uh, inside the simulation different parameters. That was the structure geometry. So there we investigated pillars, holes, and groups in streamwise and spanwise direction. And of yeah, and there we used different structure sizes. So we evaluate them from L plus equal to 10 to 236 to get an idea. Uh, a structure size of L plus equal to 10 corresponds at a container ship about 40 microns. Then, as Stefan said, um, we need to consider the ratio between the interface and the complete area, and there we have kept it constant at 75%. And we investigated two different friction Reynolds numbers, 180 and 300, that's a fully turbulent flow. And to calculate the drag reduction, um, we can say that if the bike velocity increases, the higher the drag reduction is. Next slide, please. Here you see the direct effect of drag reduction as function of um, the structure geometry, which is the color, and the structure size, which is on the x-axis. What you can see is that the drag reduction increases if you go from grooves in spanwise direction over holes to pillars and grooves in streamwise direction. And that's quite feasible because you have more yeah, parts of the structure aligned in flow direction. And if you increase the structure size, the drag reduction also increases because you have more surfaces in a row which, where, you, where the flow can accelerate. But if you, yeah, if you have a close look on the direct reduction, you see values which are in the range of up to 70%. That's quite high. Um, but if we yeah, go to structures that would be feasible in a physical application, we are in the, in the area of the red circle. So we expect direct reductions of about 10% less. Next slide, please. Here you can see a video of a simulation. And what you can see here is a normal channel. So we have a no slip condition on the wall. So the complete wall has a velocity of zero. And here we see the pressure field. So due to the velocity fluctuations, we have also pressure fluctuations. And you can also visualize vortices. And the color indicates the turning. And now we go back to, uh, to the velocity field and if we enter now a structure, you see directly the effect on the wall. So we have now a slip velocity appearing on the wall. And now the simulation speed is increased. And what you see now is that the bike velocity increased. So the color gets more and more red. And on the graph, you can see also the effect. And now we reach after some time a plateau and the location of the plateau is directly linked to the drag reduction. And if the plateau is reached, we start to temporarily average the velocity field, and then we receive something like that, which is uh, um, also spatially averaged for further post processing. Here we can see the pressure field, and what we can see is directly changes. We have a stagnation pressure in front of every pillar, and also 
the, uh, the vortices change. So we have more eddies in, yeah, in the surrounding of the wall, which are due to disturbances by the structure. Next slide, please. Now we have a look directly on the wall um, for different geometries and its sizes. And what you can see here is now the structure geometry. So in blue, we have the no slip condition. So that are the parts um, that you know, have contact between or to the water. So on the left, we have pillars and we have holes followed by grooves in streamwise and spanwise direction. And what we can see is here that um, we have more red parts, for example, for uh, grooves in streamwise direction if the structure size grows. And that's directly linked to the direct reduction you saw two slides before. Next slide, please. And here we have now a closer look to pillars. So we decrease um, the structure size. So as already mentioned, L plus equal to 10 is somewhere in the range or even a little bit bigger um, than the structures that were produced. And you see that you have less red colors. So this um, slip velocity on the wall decreases and everything gets more homogeneous. Next slide, please. Now we have a look on velocity profiles. So in, uh, in black, you see a normal velocity profile um, for a no-slip configuration. So on, on the x-axis, you have the distance from the wall. So on the left side, you're directly on the wall. And if you go to the right side, you go to the middle of the channel. And there we have two, uh, three different layers. So the first one is called um, the viscous sublayer, then we have that goes up to y plus equal to five. Then we have a so called buffer layer that goes up to 20. And above that, we have the logarithmic domain. And if we now introduce the structure, um, we see a rise in the velocity profile. So the complete velocity profile is shifted upwards. And the left uh, or and the first point on the left side is direct or is that's the, the slip velocity. And yeah, the, you see the same effect as mentioned before. So um, the slip velocity rises from uh, depending on the structure side, uh, structure geometry, and the structure size. And what we do now is uh, and yeah, that contributes to drag reduction. So if we have more area under the curve the higher the drag reduction is. And what we do now is that we subtract the slip velocity so, um, at the wall. Next slide, please. And what you can see now is that we have also a change in the logarithmic domain. So the logarithmic domain gets um, bigger, so it extends to the wall and the velocity yeah, is getting lower there. And that's linked to a drag increase. So in total, we have a drag reduction due to the upward shift, but it's a little bit reduced um, due to the downward shift in the uh, logarithmic domain. Next slide, please. And with this, I would like to come to a conclusion. So we have conducted direct numerical simulations of turbulent channel flow at two different friction Reynolds numbers. And there we investigated different structure geometries and different sizes of those. And what you could find is that the deck drag reduction rises with increasing structure size. And it rises from um, grooves in spanwise direction over holes to pillars and to grooves in streamwise direction. And if, uh, and if we had a look on the velocity profiles, we could find that we have a slip velocity on the wall and that contributes to direct reduction. And we have an en enlargement of the logarithmic domain towards the wall, and that subtracts a little bit from the direct reduction. Overall, we have to say that the enlargement on the, and the decrease is yeah, less compared to the increase. So in overall, we have a direct reduction. Yeah, and with this, I would like to thank and hand over to Clement. 
Thank you, Christophe. Thank you, Albert. Um, meanwhile, we received um, an additional uh, question. Um, they would like to know if it's possible to transfer the results from the channel flow uh, that you presented to uh, outer flows. So for example, in our case, to ships. Could you explain uh, that? Yes, in general, that is, uh, that's partially possible. Um, the flow is a little bit different if we have a, a flow around a, sh a ship hull, of course, uh, we have a boundary layer which is de developing. And uh, in this case, um, it was a fully developed channel flow. So that is a little bit different. But in both cases, um, we have a turbulent, we have a turbulent wall bounded flow. And um, that's uh, the reason why we can compare that. Very well. Thank you, Albert. Thank you, Christophe. So let's uh, get to the conclusion with Jonathan. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for presenting your results within the ACODE project. So um, everybody who hosted the session here, uh, I hope everybody in the audience got a good idea of what we're doing in the ACODE project. You learned about the Zavinia effect and yeah, how hopefully you get our idea how nature can have reduced emissions. So you saw what we did in the past three years, but I still um, want to give you some information of the uh, challenges we have ahead of us and what we're planning for our final year within the ECHO project. So as already mentioned, we got this. Can you go to the next slide, please, Kamos? Thank you. So um, as already mentioned, we have this problem um, with some gas saturations during our laboratory experiments. So um, throughout the experiments, the gas saturation drops. Also, the saturation is uh, highly depending on pressure and on temperature. And as you can see on the picture, after a uh, time of um, running the experiment, the LIR starts to vanish. So this is our goal for this last year to validate the numerical results that we've presented here with some physical experiments. The next challenge um, that we have just ahead of us and is scheduled for June, we would like to coat a little research vessel. So the complete hull should be covered with air coat. This was not uh, possible before due to the travel restrictions. Uh, keep your fingers crossed that this will go down in June and then we have our first vessel completely covered in our coach. And another challenge that we are facing is the hydrophobicity of the material. As Stefan already explained, when the structure size increases, drag reduction increases, but also the air retention is difficult. So our goal is to increase the hydrophobicity. And with an increase of the hydrophobicity, the air retention will also rise and we can have higher drag reduction with larger sizes. Um, yeah, in the end, I would like to uh, mention that ECHO received funding from the EU and there's a, a Horizon 2020 project. And also we would like to thank this to the support of North German Supercomputing Alliance, which made the numerical Simulations for the results we presented here were made possible by them. So I hope you enjoyed our webinar on the ACO project. Uh, I will hand over to Clemence one last time and she will let you know how you can get in contact with us if you have any questions later on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, we received another uh, question. So as we are right on time, let's take two minutes if you, if you agree to respond. Um, so this is a question. Could the air cut foil be also applied for sailing boats, cruising, racing yachts to avoid the use of normal anti-fooling? So who would like to respond to this one? Well, I, I can say something based on uh, based on the experience uh, from the partners. So the plan is to uh, uh, start with the small vessels first, 
So, uh, for example, you saw the example with the uh, with the yacht. So that's exactly one of the test platforms. So I would imagine that um, also other kinds of vessels, but uh, I don't know the rules of the raising yacht. So if this would be allowed, because I think they have very specific rules, what can be done? So I'm not an expert in, in that sense. Thank you, Yuka Pega. Is uh, someone wants to add something? No? So thank you everyone for additional questions. You can uh, of course write to us to our email, so info at aircodeproject.eu. Um, and then we can answer after the webinar, of course, we would be happy to. I would like to thank you all. So for all the speakers today, thank you all. Thank you for the attendees, for your participation. Uh, we hope this overview of the Air Cottage 2020 project was useful and leads you to other coaching alternatives coming on the market, let's hope. Um, if you'd like to follow the Air Code project, of course, you can still subscribe to our newsletter. You can follow our website, you will find it in the chat and follow us on social media, uh, LinkedIn and Twitter, where we post regularly our updates. Thank you all again. And I wish you a very nice evening. Thank you. Bye bye.